We're here at Baylock on the border of counties Tipperary and Waterford. Our drawing for the whale journey has led us here after springing from a desire to find out a little bit more about the portrayals of women in Irish song, music and folklore. So obviously we know loads of tunes that have women in the title and we really wanted to find out a little bit more about the real women whose names were made famous or in some cases infamous in these tunes and songs. We read loads of interesting stories and we had a few great candidates but the story that really captured our attention and our imagination was the story of a woman known as Petticoat Loose. Now Petticoat Loose was a big, tall, strong woman and she could do the work of any man around the farm and drink any man under the table to boot. Of course, she wasn't always known as Petticoat Loose. She was born one Mary Hannigan in Colligan in County Waterford. Now more than anything else, she loved to dance. And it was during one particularly notable night of revelry that she got this famous nickname. She was spinning around the dance floor when her petticoats caught in a nail and they were ripped from her. She was left skirts around her ankles, the laughing stock of the village. The name stuck and she was known as Petticoat Loose forever afterwards. Petticoat Loose married a local farmer, the only man who could match her step for step on the dance floor. After the wedding, they were often seen out together cutting a fine figure on the dance floor. But as time wore on, he settled into the marriage and he preferred to stay at home beside the fire instead of going out. So Petticoat Loose was left to take to the town and make her own fun. Not too long after that, a young scholar and fiddler caught her eye. He returned her advances and the two of them cooked up a plan to do away with the husband. Some say they drowned him, others that they buried him on the farm. It was around this time that Petticoat Loose opened up her own she bean across the road from the church. The parish priest was known to denounce her from the pulpit every chance he got for serving drink during mass time. It was during one of these sessions of music and drink that a visiting Spalpeen, who had heard of Mary's propensity for the drink, challenged her to a drinking contest. Little did she know it was going to be the last drink she ever took. As the church bells tolled, Petticoat Loose keeled over, stone dead. But that wasn't the last of Petticoat Loose. Not long after she died, a man was traveling on a horse and cart one night, passing a bridge near Colligan, when he met an old woman who stopped him and asked him for a lift. He obliged and she climbed up behind him. He shook the reins to go off, but the horse would not budge. It was sweating as though carrying a two ton weight. The blood drained from the man's face and he realised that it was none other than the spirit of Petticoat Loose herself that was up behind him. He pulled out a black handled knife and he stuck it in her. Tiring and ski and a saw reach day, says she. Pull the knife and stick it again. But he wouldn't dare, for he knew that if you stabbed a spirit with iron, you could kill it. But if you pulled the blade and thrust it again, it was you who'd meet your sorry end. Now the people of Colligan were growing weary of this haunting. Petticoat Loose was pestering them night after night. It was around this time that the parish priest was called in to take matters in hand. Well, he went out one night and of course she showed up as always. The parish priest stood up to her. What was it that damned you, he said. I watered down the milk I was selling, says she. That was not what damned you. I killed two babies before they were baptised. That is not what damned you, he says. Ara, I died in drunkenness, says she. That is what damned you. The priest then banished Petticoat Loose to Baylock, a deep, dark lake high in the Knockmeal Down Mountains. There she was to remain until Law Aluin, Doomsday. Some say her task was to make ropes out of sand, while others say she was to empty the lake using only a thimble. They say she's there still, atoning for her many sins. So you're very welcome here to ITMA today, uh, Dr. Anne O'Connor, folklorist and editor of the Bailages Journal. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here with both of you. Thanks very much. So Anne, we've just started looking at some of the Petticoat Loose stories and it's been so interesting, but you're the person really who's delved deeper than anyone else into this. So could you tell us a little bit about your research and what you've come across about Petticoat Loose? Sure, yeah. Well, I mean, it's such a wonderful name, isn't it, Petticoat Loose? Absolutely. Conscious of all kinds of images. Um, well, I suppose I'll just start by saying, you know, folklore. People sometimes think they know what folklore is. Now, to tell you the truth, we're all still wondering what folklore really is. Um, but it's not old. It's not things that were, you know, told long ago in Ireland by the fireside. It is that too. 
but it's not just that. So, I mean, we kind of see it as uh, something that is trans material, which is transmitted orally or non, you know, by demonstration, such as a craft, for instance, and it varies and it's anonymous and it also becomes traditional. So there's a kind of a collective engagement. I remember always Hugh Shields talking about um, the song tradition in Ireland, and he said that it, it, functions as, it, it functions as something that creates communal cohesion. And I always thought that's a really good way, a really succinct way of putting it, because folk, that is what folklore is about. It's about a community of people who are sharing ideas, beliefs, values, stories, songs, music, dances, whatever it happens to be. So that's kind of the context, if you like. And then the other thing which a lot of historians find difficult is that we have to be very careful about the historical aspect. The context, the socio-historical context, and in my case, religious context, is really important. And that's where those stories to do with Petticoat Loose come in. They're not just kind of, they are stories about transgressive women who are kind of did dreadful things, so-called. At the core of them is a really important religious story about a woman who is damned. Like, these are spirits who are damned. They're not, there's no forgiveness. They're damned to hell and to um, forever. And that's because of the various things that they're said to have, the crimes they have committed. And the one that's most important from my perspective and the one that I have found is the key to the whole story complex, if you like, and the belief complex, is that the woman is charged with having killed an unbaptized child, either by, because she's the mother or because she was a midwife who was paid to do something like that. So that started me off essentially on looking into everything to do with childbirth and women's traditions in Ireland, as well as that context, if you like, of the religious tradition. Absolutely, <laughs> it's so interesting. So can you tell us a bit more about that, the religious context of the time or when were these stories yes. coming yeah. to the fore? At that time, in say in the 30s, 40s, 50s, when the Folklore Commission was really active, very, very active, um, full-time collectors all over the country and, and, and collecting all sorts of stories, particularly in Irish, um, people really believed that there was the kind of an unbroken line of transmission in terms of Catholic religion between, say, our grandfathers and ancestors and the present day, the present day of the 30s or 50s. And the collectors were, the main collectors, the full-time collectors were all men. And they're, they're operating in that Irish Catholic ethos of the new state. Um, and a very strong link between Gaelic, so-called Gaelic nationalism and Roman Catholicism. And the realization that, you know, values from that so-called wonderful age had to be um, entrenched. So many things weren't collected and many people don't feature in the collections, in the National Folklore Collection. On the other hand, it is one of the most fantastic collections of folklore in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of the religious context, I think the most important way to put it, without boring you, is to say that um, what really happens is that if you think about the other world, beliefs about the other world, death and the other world in Irish tradition, well, we have the kind of Christian other world of heaven and hell and limbo and purgatory. And what happened really is that these concepts, um, they were in the population, they were part of the tradition. But because of the Reformation, which occurred, the Reformations really, which occurred really from the 15th to 16th centuries onwards, things changed. But because Ireland was, was primarily Catholic at the time, a lot of the older traditions remained in a way that they were kind of got rid of, if you like, in the reformed countries, say England, for instance, or the Nordic countries. So what happens then is that we have a counter-reformation and that is where these stories mostly are revived. There are medieval themes in these stories, then they're revived to the counter-reformation in the 16th, 17th centuries. We see emerging then the tune that you talk about and the air of Petticoat Lose in the 18th century, mostly from Britain. Um, which isn't really connected with it because it's not religious. Those, those songs and tunes and, are not religious. But in terms of the story itself and the motifs that are in it, which are very specifically Christian, we, see, we really see there that this story, and it's part of a bigger complex actually of women who murder children, but also the souls of unbaptized children and what happens to them in the afterlife. You mentioned some of the motifs there. Could you maybe describe a little bit more about what kind of recurring themes or ideas do we see in these stories? So while there are kind of almost comic elements to it, 
And the stories of the background of how she lost her plastic coat or how she was drunk or how she was killing her husband or whatever, all those things in the background. Um, the essence of it is that this is a spirit that cannot be allowed to live. Well, why were these motifs so important and what were they telling us about the worldview, the mindset of people? And of course they were terrifying for children and women and mm -hmm. men and for everybody that these kind of spirits could exist and that they would be so dangerous. But we also see the power of the priest, mm -hmm. really important. Yeah. He was able to ex exercise these spirits. I was talking to somebody who had heard the story told in, um, in Ring years ago, but not that many years ago. Um, and he remembered somebody in, somebody in the pub saying to a child, go on up to bed now or Petticoat Loose will get you. Yes. So it really was <laughs> yeah. used as a... Yeah, it was a bogey. Yeah. yeah, a bit like the bogey man. Yeah, wow. absolutely. And actually they have that in Newfoundland, Irish people who went from that Waterford area over. Um, brought those stories with them and it survives over there. Wow, that's yeah. amazing to see how it spreads. It's yes. It doesn't yeah. become such yeah. an international thing. Yeah. And yeah. speaking then of international, we've been looking into the tune called Petticoat Loose and yes. there's a tune that we started this whole project kind of that we knew as Petticoat Loose. Mm. Um, but looking back then, we're seeing that there was an early version of this tune um, that would have predated probably this woman in Waterford. So the tune maybe came from England or Scotland in the maybe 1750s, we think. Mm, that's right. So yeah. is there a connection between the tune and the story? Is it a coincidence that they have the same name? Because now a lot of times um, a musician might introduce the tune and mention the story and kind mm. of, you know, put yeah. them together. So what's your take on that? There are a lot of tunes, um, a lot of stories, even novels um, called Petticoat Loose. Then that name persists, um, but there isn't a direct link. I think it's only actually in more recent times since we began to look at the story that the musicians have kind of attached it to it. So um, just going back to what you were kind of mentioning earlier, your own interest in um, the meaning of these stories and what they tell us about the society of the time mm -hmm. and the ideology of the time. Um, can you just tell us a bit about what do we learn about the portrayals of women from these stories and what's that tell us about the, the time they were told in? These stories would be moral tales. These are moral tales told for people to, you know, to realise that it's, the sacraments are really important, that repentance is important, that forgiveness is important, um, and that punishment is also there if, if you don't do what you're supposed to do in the religious context. So it tells us very much that the importance of the um, Christian um, beliefs particularly Catholic dogma. I mean, Irish religious tradition is primarily Catholic, as it can, must be, of course, because that's, um, that has been so important but that people clung to it when they weren't allowed to, <laughs> says an awful lot about its tenacity in terms of the popular imagination. We see traces of it in, say, something like the Kerry Babies case in 1985. We see it in Anne Lovett in uh, Granard in 1984. I mean, especially in the Kerry Babies case, I always remember in 1985 listening to some of the, uh, the trials and what was said, you know, and I, just as an example, the idea that a woman had sex with two men and then she had two separate babies, one of whom she presumably, you know, killed with a knife on a street, st uh, strand 20 miles away from where she lived or whatever. That's, that's an example of medieval thinking. So the legacy lives on and that's why folklore can be very potent been so satisfying finding like pieces of the jigsaw puzzle <laughs> yeah. almost mm. you know like we're not sure if we have any real conclusion <laughs> no. but we've had a really interesting journey yeah. <laughs> doing mm, yeah. trying to find out more so yeah. thank you so much no i'm delighted it's been great to great talk, to talk to about these things well, thank yeah. you so much <laughs> brilliant thank you both very much <laughs>
I was in Ronan Brown's class that year, and the year before, Ronan and Pather O'Loughlin had brought out their album, The Southwest Wind, and the title track, That Jig Is Paired With Pepsi Coat Loose. So that's where I know that tune from, yeah. Do you, have, do you fancy giving us a blast of that one? We've, quite, we've found sure. a few different versions along the way, so we're trying to piece together which yeah. is which. So it's the, it's the three-part jig in G. I suppose that's the, the version where we started off this project with and the commonly played one. Um, we'd kind of associate it with Willie Clancy. Yeah. And we were wondering, once we went back to look at the uh, manuscripts, we found that we, there was no mention of a third part anywhere. So we were wondering, would you have any idea how that might have come about? Could it have been Clancy that added that part? Oh, that's interesting. Um... It seems to be the middle part that's different. So mm. the version, there is a G major version a bit like that in the uh, Tunes of the Monster Pipers, the Goodman right. collection, um, but there isn't that middle part. Interesting. Um, a lot of the time when we see parts added on, uh, it's, it's a fairly common thing. Uh, there's loads of examples, things like The Boy in the Gap. We know that Paddy Taylor was supposed to have written the third part for The, the Boy in the Gap. Um, I can't think of any examples we know of Willie Clancy actually writing a, a part, but we do know that he he put together versions and he worked up versions of tunes. So things like the Humes of Ballylochlin or the Gold Ring, the versions we play today, are ones that Willie would have settled on as his version of those tunes. So I'm not sure about Petticoat Loose, but we do know that he, he was very conscious about the versions of tunes that he played, yeah. Right. There's a recording of him uh, with Brendan Brannock speaking to him mm -hmm. and uh, Brannock asks him, did he have any story associated with the tune? And he says, he thinks there was an old story. He kind of makes reference to that. But then Brannock asks him, was there any connection with Donal Nagrania? Now, Donal Nagrania is a song that's also called The Leg of the Duck. And, and in that, Clancy says, no, not at all. But we see other people saying that they are related. Do you know, what's your take on that? And were there words to that tune? I don't know, I know, but there used to be some old stories. But I felt stories with that title, whether it had to directly to do with the tune. I felt that they didn't have any music at all. I just remember one particular man had a story about Pity Goes Loose. Oh, that was your father's name for that? It was, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't Donald McGrady. Oh, it wasn't, no. Lee, my Flynn recorded this on his solo album, and he calls what we call Petticoat Loose, he called it the leg of the duck. Okay. And we can hear that pattern in the first part as well, you know, the... Yeah. We hear that as the, the leg of the duck as well, so... Um, yeah, it's interesting. There's definitely connections there between those two. And then we hear as well, um, there seems to be some confusion with um, Clancy's um, petticoat, petticoat Loose and then Strop the Razor. It seems yeah. to be sometimes, James Kelly mentioned that he, uh, Willie Clancy had always called what we were calling there Petticoat Loose, he had called that Strop the Razor from what James knew. So yeah. any idea what happened there? I've heard it called Strop the Razor as well as mm. Petticoat Loose by, by Pipers. Uh, I know Clancy recorded this jig, the one I played, in 1956 in London, and it was called Petticoat Loose then. He records another jig, three parts again in G, in the 1960s, and that's on, uh, on Show to Kell, the Galen LP. So um, he has two different titles there, so definitely Petticoat Loose and Strop the Razor. He seems to identify as different And tunes, it's a different, so. is, what's the tune that he plays as, as Strop the Strop Razor? Strop the Razor, the one he recorded on that LP, and it's called Strop the Razor, is the one that starts.
difference. There's so, a lot of similarities and yeah. little me melodic features that are kind Definitely of the same. Very similar, yeah. Interesting. So one of the other things we noticed in our in our research into it was that um, at some point in in the kind of passing along of these tunes, mm. there was a minor version. Um, so we're we've been playing one that we found from a collection that mentions a piper called John Murphy, and that's in a kind of a minor key. Do you have any idea, or do you know anything about John Murphy or John Murphy's name, common name, but as a, the John Murphy the piper turns up in London at the very start of the 19th century. It's possible that he was playing a more minor version of, of the tune because we have all the keys on the chanter available to us to, to play uh, the notes to, to change the tune quite a lot. So It's actually, in his notation or the way it's written down, it's, it's in an A minor kind of a key, like yeah. A minor C kind of tonality. So, um, but then we see in the, the Goodman collection, the Munster Pipers tunes, two versions of Petticoat Loose, one that's in G major and one that's in G minor. Do you think that like musicians may have, I don't know, read a manuscript that was written in G minor and decided, oh, this might be nicer in a major key or? Absolutely, I'm sure that happens all the time that, that people will use manuscript as inspiration for, for a version or a misreading leads to a, a, a nice new, way to yeah, play something. Yeah. And yeah, it definitely happens. But it's interesting that Pipers were playing this tune 200 years ago and it's still played today. So it's something that obviously has always sat well on the pipes. You know, it's yeah. uh, that pipes have picked it up at different times, yeah. One of the other collections that was really, really useful to us for this was the um, Fleischmann collection, which we didn't really know anything about beforehand. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting because that brought in even more links that we hadn't found before, such as, um, I think it was mentioned that this Petticoat Loose could be related to Chair Wallyroo. So more kind of connections coming in. But do you know anything much about that collection? Could you tell us a bit about it? Um, Fleischmann's sources of Irish traditional music kind of compiles all of the collections up to a certain point. So a lot of those more obscure and small collections that were out there are available through this big set of volumes. And it can be quite interesting to look through some of the tunes that are quite common and see how they develop through the different collections. Occasionally you will get one tune that's copied from one to another and straight through. But yeah, I, I like taking a look at Fleischmann and having a look through at different versions and iterations of the same tune. Yeah, it can be interesting. It's kind of like a timeline for us in this kind of puzzling out what was going on with the... Yeah, and it, it, can, it can be surprising the things that you'll find that are way older than you've expected or mm -hmm. that were found way back, a bit like this tune. Yeah, and yeah. we found Donal Negrania in that, which is also the leg of the duck, and it doesn't put the, them together. It has lots of versions of Petticoat Loose and then some versions of Donal Negrania, so they seem to think that they weren't the same tune. Right. Mm -hmm. It's all quite subjective really though, isn't it? Yeah. You know, um, something that I might think is a version of a tune, you might say, oh no, that's completely yeah. different. I'd, yeah. I'd hear them as completely different tunes. So yeah. it's, it's quite, yeah, it's all so down no, to the no individual. No clear answers really are yeah. there with it. Yeah. <laughs> Even with this, uh, say, the two, two versions in the Goodman collection, um, from the minor to the major, there's kind of an inversion of kind of where the tune goes to. Uh, a certain point um, that makes them a little bit different from each other. I think the thing that when there's like the leg of the duck where there are uh, lyrics in there, the most memorable part is often the chorus. Mm. And so it's very easy for parts to get switched around yeah. from what we'd consider an instrumental first part, you know, and a second part that's actually the chorus of a song can easily get switched around that way yeah. as well. I think the common thing in all of them is this really repetitive kind of phrasing that's coming up over and over and it, that lends itself well to, to songs as well, doesn't it? And if you're finding a lot of versions, it just shows the popularity and the fact that it must have been well known in the oral tradition and people are picking it up and yeah. it's getting written down at different times and you're picking it up written down differently. So it just shows it's, it's out there and it's yeah. popular over a long time amongst a lot of different people. I wonder if there being a story had anything to do with how popular it was. There could be, you know, that maybe people, you know, remembered the tune because they remembered the character or this terrifying, w wicked woman, so... That's a form of entertainment as well, isn't it? If, if, yeah. you can, if you can add a story to a tune, it gives context and it's more entertaining than just playing something that's strictly melodic. Yeah. It gives you something to talk about at 
the start of a set of tunes in the gig <laughs> as well. That's true, yeah, exactly. So, Emma, thank you so much for coming in to chat to us. It's been brilliant and having a Piper's perspective has been really helpful for us, I think. So no, thank no you problem. so much for your time. Happy yeah. to be here. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It's been great. We discovered lots and lots of mentions of Petticoat Loose in various different music collections here in ITMA. So the, the tune that we've selected from all of these versions to perform is from the collection called Waifs and Strays of Gaelic Melody. Um, so collected by Captain Francis O'Neill, it was published in 1922. But it's a very similar tune to the tune in G major that's in the Goodman collection from, from a bit earlier in the 1800s. So we're coming back then to look at um, O'Neill's 1001 Gems, The Dance Music of Ireland. Um, this is a gorgeous first edition that was given to Sean Potts by Matt Malloy. It's got an wow. inscription here, which is lovely. And it lives here in Itma now? Yeah. So this is from Amazing. 1907. And the tune found in here is a completely different version. There's a petticoat loose in here, but it's, it's a completely separate version to the one um, published in Waifs and Strays. Um, so this... This is the one that we managed to hear um, in the archive. There's a recording of Dennis Murphy playing this. That's right. Yeah. Um, and then this seems to be the same tune as it's known now in Clare as the Rooms of Dua often. And there seems there's suggestions of a connection with Brian O'Lynn as well. Mm. Um, and I've seen maybe the Maiden that jigs it in style as potentially being related yeah, so as well. Yeah, there's a lot of different links coming from this too. Yeah. This is the tune that was selected um, the lovely collection called Otherworld that Rhianna Theogain and Tom Sherlock put together with folklore stories and and music together. Mm, um, there's actually a telling of Petticoat Loose in yeah, that. Yeah, and that's this Petticoat Loose that is played on that album. So, right. And um, um, there's a tune that comes from this then we found in the, do you remember looking at the P.W. Joyce collection? So it seems to be the very same tune, or very slight differences, in a couple of years later in 1909. But he doesn't call it Petticoat Loose and that, he calls it um, the Banks of Glen O. So we might yeah. play that. That was when we visited Baylock, we decided to put together the Banks of Glen O or Petticoat Loose and another tune that's related to something that pops up in the story, this idea of pull the knife and stick it again. Mm.
It was brilliant to find this article when we searched through the catalogue in ITMA. We looked for references to Petticoat Loose and I was so excited to find this article by Pork O'Mahon. So in this he talks about a song version of Petticoat, well Petticoat Squealche, so it's an Irish language version which links together the, the tune that we've been looking at and the story, which is kind of what our intention was in the beginning. So the, the manuscript that he refers to in this article that's, that's kept in the Royal Irish Academy is uh, James Hardyman, who collected uh, songs and melodies. I think it was said uh, no earlier than 1834. That's right. Um, so it'd be great to find out if those manuscripts have the music as well. We have the words here, which yeah. They're really interesting, um, but it'd be great to see what melody went with it. It's been great to get access to this manuscript. This is from James Hardyman's collection. Um, and it has, he obviously collected songs in the 1800s um, and it has the melody of the song and some words for Petty Goat Squilcha. Um, it's quite amazing to see it in person. It's fantastic. It's, uh, Thinking it's going all the way back. It's pre-1875. So it's, it's fantastic to see this and how well really preserved it is as well. as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's the, so neat. <laughs> I can read normal Irish, but I cannot read this script. You studied it a little bit in college. A little you? bit. I'm quite out of practice with it, but I think you can recognise a few words. Yeah, I suppose so, the spelling has changed a little bit. Yeah. But. It's funny that he has the word Venus there, like in, in old songs, Venus was always describing a really beautiful woman, wasn't it? Yeah, so it's quite a compliment for someone, for Petticoat Loose. All the other stories. Well, I suppose it, we did hear that she was a beautiful woman. She was this tall, big, strong woman, but it, that's quite, quite a compliment, really. Yeah, she was villainised in a lot of the stories. Yeah. There's a bit more that kind of suggests that as well. He's talking about her or snaith a falling. So I think like the neatness of her cloak and gach or the vashing. So she's she's fashionable. She's she's well dressed and she's beautiful. So it is a little bit more positive than some of the stories we've read yeah. about her. Um, it's great to see a link between the tunes that we spent a long time trying to figure out what tune were any of the tunes that we knew associated with the story that we knew. And this is the first real link between the two, where we see the melody that we see in some of the piping collections, like the Goodman collection. It's the same melody, more or less. There are a few little, mm. few little differences. So but to of, a story about Petticoat Loose. Yes, yeah, so we know at least it's the story and the tune were connected. <laughs> So what was this bit here at the end? Where is this going? Okay, so the script is really beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it's like gorgeous. It's, it's just stunning to read. I think in the first line it's Dramana, but it's a D, I don't know if you can see that, the D, R, O, okay. and then there's a kind of squiggle on top. <laughs> so I think that must be a symbol that's used for an M. Yeah, whereabouts is that? Dramana. Um, high tech solution. A N A, is it? Yeah. Dramana House and Gardens, Dramana Gate, uh, County Waterford, near Capa Quinn. Oh, that sits well with all our, a lot of the versions we're based in yeah. Waterford. Yeah, wow. So here we are. We've made it down to Dramana. Scene of the crime. Scene of crime. Or one of her many crimes. Got on of Dramana, my head is gone. Her gun deal, Gadini, gun deal, Gadini. Glug at a landlady, sped up cheek, nog at a briefer gun ingrits, briefer gun ingrits. Bades her gust the hall, the she gates up, let's start up no curse. She's the Gnevered Hepper, she's the Gnevered Hepper. Pope in the shafts of he name of Escarp and the petticoat squealed to petticoat squealed to. She on Venus and Van and Seer, they not make yan a dach of a deal to dach of a deal to. 
As night a falling sky came through the washing so Hankashir shield, the Hankashir shield. Nor Hagen she while she eat us and scratch the cord as fan the he, cord as fan the he. Though we sit in my dick, I go to Sir Hagen, yes, Thomas got you, yes, Thomas got you. Sneel brother, no sagard, no clad of the martin, the gas of the clear, the gas of the clear. Nor veen le she log and le maids in her pack as a mahavur each day, mahavur each day. Let they not let tan of let rehear the farces and mock a dirty roof, mock a dirty roof. Veen smat a bell crass and so shoe let a lah, egg petticoat squealed, a petticoat squealed. Sa ward and anam tosh gale a cum hogger petticoat squealed, a petticoat squealed. The honic and shoe the she swing nurse and egg dead in the he head, dead in the he head. Fakum da wish and their breach the air lober no non will to cleach a non will to cleach a. Gird am satan taka de lay satan gather shin temple da khrisa temple da khrisa. Well, this has been such an interesting process altogether. I've really, really enjoyed taking part in Drawn from the Well, and I've really enjoyed the topic we picked. And it's amazing to think of this is just one tune and the amount of material that came out of this and how many different paths we could have took and that we didn't have time to mention. Massive thanks to all the people who've helped us along the way. We had amazing help um, in the archive, especially from Alan Woods. And um, also want to thank Liam O'Connor for inviting us to take part in this. And um, we spoke to loads of, of people and thanks so much to all the people who gave up their time to help us with this. Um, yeah, I think particularly Anne O'Connor and Emma Gill, where it was fantastic to talk to them. Yeah. And also James Kelly, who helped us uh, along the way as well. And, I, and then huge thanks to the, the crew who helped put all of this together and put up with us for a few days in Tipperary and Waterford and here in Dublin. So, um, yeah, it's been great. Yeah. I think it just shows that it's one of those things that the more you learn, the less you know about it, yeah. really. And the more there is to find out. Yeah, there's been so many parallels between the folklore and the, the music and then the, the way the tunes were collected, the way the stories were collected and passed on. And um, it's been really interesting. It's been fantastic, yeah. <laughs>